Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Canadian Packaging EPR. I'm Mary Ann Remolador, Assistant Director of the Northeast Recycling Council, which is also known as NERC. We are delighted to host today's webinar and to be able to share information about packaging EPR. Before we get started, I just want to review some details. Everyone has been put on mute except for the train passing my office. Um, uh, we welcome your questions throughout the webinar, and uh, there, sh there is a question box that you should see on your screen. So please fill out your questions uh, whenever you have them, and we'll address all questions at the end. Um, if you don't see a box with questions, you may see an orange arrow somewhere at the top of your screen. If you click on that, it'll open up the dialog box for the webinar. We also wanted to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, and the webinar recording and the presentation will all be posted on NERC's website um, by tomorrow. Let me repeat that because this is a question we oftentimes get throughout the webinars. The re both the recording and all of the presentations will be available on NERC's website tomorrow. Okay, so today I'm really delighted um, to introduce our three speakers. We have Matthew Gilmetz, who is the Senior Director of Services to Municipalities at Eco Enterprises Quebec. Joanne St. Goddard, Executive Director of the Recycling Council of Ontario, and David Lefebvre, Director of Public Affairs at Recycle BC. And first, we're going to hear from Matthew Gilmet. Thank you very much. Uh, Marianne, thank you for to the Nordis Recycling Council for this opportunity to share our experience with EPR on PPP in the province of Quebec. Um, by now, you should all see my presentation on the screen. So I'm going to start first by a a quote from uh, Groucho Marx, which I like. Learn from the mistakes of others. You can never live long enough to make them all yourself. Um, I like that, that one because I, I want to stress on this. I want to be very humble today in sharing what we, what's working well in Quebec and what needs to be improved. And I'm pretty sure that you can get some good insight from all other pro programs in Canada as well. So a little bit about myself. I've been with Eco Entreprise Quebec for 13 years now. Um, being so long in the same organization, well, you, you get at some point where you've done pretty much everything, uh, which I did. Um, at the very beginning, I was into the negotiation of the net cost for Cubeside Recycling. I worked on the contribution um, uh, on the fee schedule uh, for our contributing companies. I worked on waste audit, active debate casting studies. I, mani I manage the away from home recovery program. And right now I'm managing the municipal best practice initiative to uh, help municipalities improve their curbside recycling. So first a little bit about the Quebec context. Um, we have a population of 8.4 million, um, with more than 99% of the population that has access to door-to-door -to -door recycling. So that's uh, fairly uh, a, a thorough, thorough coverage of all the province. The quantity recovered per capita is around close to 100 kilos per person, and um, we the curbside recycling covers 1,100 municipalities with um, 557 municipalities and municipal bodies that actually manage curbside recycling contracts because, of course, there are some grouping in municipalities, in uh, regional municipalities, for example, or uh, uh, different other municipal organizations. Each year, there is close to 800,000 tons of material that is recovered, which makes for a recovery rate of around 63%. Uh, material is managed in 23 
different sorting centers all across the province. And one particularity of the province curbside recycling is that there is there are many different models of sorting centers, non-for-profit, private, municipal, etc. And they are fairly small sorting centers and fairly big too. So a little bit of context about the evolution of EPR in Quebec. Uh, curbside recycling began in the 80s in, in some municipalities. Um, and there was at the very beginning in, in 90, uh, 1987, a voluntary program put in place by, by, by what should be the um, ancestor of EEQ. It was called Collect Selective Quebec. And that was a voluntary program financed by the companies, private companies, to finance uh, both um, investment in sorting centers and to help municipalities to buy a recycling bin. In 2005, the, the Quebec Environment Quality Act was amended and the, uh, well, actually in, in 2002 and in 2005, the regulation for the uh, curbside recycling financing was uh, put in place. So since then, uh, EEQ has been representing companies for their container and packaging and print and paper with regard to their obligation to finance the system. At the beginning, the compensation was 50%, but now it's 100% uh, since uh, 2013. So um, in summary, how does the system work right now? You have on one side the municipalities that gives the contract for collection and sorting of the material. Uh, each year they have to report their net cost to uh, Recyc Québec, which, which is the state agency responsible of uh, superseding the system. Uh, and they communicate the cost to EQ. And in turn, EQ has to produce a fee schedule so our contributing companies will pay or uh, will contribute to those costs, and we send the check back to Recy Quebec, which has, sends it back to uh, the municipalities. The costs to be offset are uh, the cost of collection, transportation, and sorting. So uh, very easy to uh, to remember. Um, and the designated material, as I said, it's container packaging and printed matter or printed paper. Um, I have to say that um, newspapers are uh, targeted by the regulation, but they are under another uh, stewardship organization responsibility. So let's talk a little bit about the EEQ's role. Uh, we are a private not-for-profit not organization based in Montreal. We are certified by the Quebec government since uh, June 2005, and we represent 3,400 companies that put on the market container packaging and print and matter. We do work both um, upstream and downstream the curbside recycling value chain. Uh, why is that so? Is that at the very beginning, our contributing companies wanted to have an influence on a curbside recycling all across Quebec, um, not just being on the sidelines and paying for the system, but uh, they wanted to get involved, and, and we put in place a lot of initiatives toward that goal. So as I said, our mission is twofold. Uh, first, to finance the system, Uh, since the beginning, it amounts to um, $1.5 billion collected and, and paid to the municipality over the past 15 years. And then, as I said, to optimize with innovative approach by promoting circular economy and by working with our contributing companies uh, to help them develop more eco-responsible packaging. The company's contribution is based on the schedule of contribution or fee schedule that is de uh, developed and published each year. 
Uh, the fees are developed in a way to um, recognize the best performing material and penalize the, the not so well performing material. So uh, we take into consideration first the uh, recovery rate of each material and uh, the cost per ton to manage each material. And with those two components, we do a fee for each and every material. I'm going to give you a few examples here. So as you can see here, um, there, there are a few of the 30 different materials that we target. Um, uh, when I'm talking about newsprint here, is not newspaper, it's actually printed material on, on, uh, on newsprint material, actually. So uh, you can see that there is a huge difference in the fees between, let's say, PT bottles and uh, polystyrene. And that's because mostly uh, PT is actually has actually a good recovery rate in Quebec and a fairly low cost when um, at the opposite polystyrene is uh, as a less as a, a worse recovery rate and it's fairly costly to recover and the market is not as developed as it could be so as I said the EQ uh, is working toward optimization of the system there are many initiatives that we put in place over the years we worked um, to make the system easier and uh, to understand and uh, give higher accessibility to uh, curbside recycling to the citizens, for example, with pro uh, out away from home program. We worked with municipalities to improve their practices, um, work with sorting center. We had a big initiative where we invested $13 million to pay for new equipments in sorting center to sort the glass. We are working with um, uh, end market to, to develop those markets for uh, recovered material. And of course, we work upstream with our companies to either um, take some recovered material in their packaging or to improve uh, their packaging in the first place to make them more recyclable, for example. One of the initiative I prefer, and it's, it's the one that, that I manage actually, is the best practice in, initiative for effective curbside recycling. Um, this is our collaborative approach with municipalities all across the province to improve, to improve curbside recycling. The objective of this initiative is, um, our, um, there are four objectives actually. Uh, first, to secure best value for money which doesn't mean that we want to lower the cost, but to make sure that we get the most for every buck we pay. Uh, to improve services to citizens, as I said, with higher accessibility to curbside recycling, but uh, with, uh, to ensure access to better, easier to understand information. Um, to increase the quantities recovered and to improve the quality of the recovered material, both uh, at the curb, but also uh, uh, increase the quality of the material that's going out of the uh, MERS all across the province. And how we do so? Um, well, we're on the field, we're meeting with municipalities, we uh doing some workshop with them, we publish tools, we offer um, uh, a customized service to a municipality to help them improve their uh, RFPs, etc. So what do we do to improve the system in uh, the years to come? Um, well, of course, uh, all across the world, the uh, China's market's uh, closure have had a huge impact on the, the price of the material that were coming in, the, in the MERS. And even worse, for some material, there is no market anymore. So um, it was an, an eye-opener for many municipalities, for many MERS, and we think that we can, moving forward, have a better system more com uh, with more traceability, more quality, more efficiency.
So um, at least there are some benefits of EPR with the actual system in Quebec. It makes producers accountable for what they put on the market. So the producer are paying um, more than $150 million per year, and we just presented our fee schedule uh, uh, yesterday. It's going to be 20% more in the, for the next year. Uh, that makes them accountable, and um, this really had a, a huge impact on just the sheer consideration of what what are the impact of their packaging and printed matter uh, on, on the recycling system. So it, it was it was really an eye opener for many companies. Two, um, the actual EPR system offers stability for municipalities in times of crisis. I've heard on the news that uh, there are a few municipalities across uh, across the United States that uh, really changed their recycling program. Some even stopped altogether to collect the material um, because of the financial burden of the crisis. So um, at least in Quebec, uh, there is uh, the EPR system to support the municipality. Uh, and help them face the crisis. And then at the end, it provides municipality with some information about others' performance. And that's, that's, uh, that was a novelty 15 years ago because each and every municipality was doing his own little thing and they didn't know actually how, how did, did they compare to other municipalities. So with, with EPR, they actually have a, a point of comparison with other municipalities. So that triggers, that fosters um, emulation. Things that could be improved or that could be fixed. Um, I have six to present. Uh, first, we have to increase eco design of uh, materials that are that are put on the market. We've seen in recent years a shift from some material to others. Uh, we've, she, we, we, we've seen, for example, um, a huge trend to uh, switch from uh, some metal or glass container to, uh, for example, stand-up pouches, which are a challenge in the curbside recycling system, although they, th they can have really good impact on, uh, on the environment with uh, less greenhouse gas, gases emissions, um, those are a challenge in, in the curbside recycling system. So we need to work on that with current contributing companies to make those packaging better, better and easier to recycle. Um, we need to be working more, uh, helping consumers to understand what to place in the recycling bins. There are still some materials who have abysmal uh, recovery rate uh, at the curve, although recycling has been there for 30 years now. Um, it's, it's, it's surprising to see that steel can only has a recovery rate around 50-60%, although it's very easy to, re to recover, for example. So we need to, to, to better inform the citizen on what to put in their blue bin and also what not to put. Uh, in their recycling bins to reduce contamination. Um, I know that uh, there is the recycling partnership who's working really hard on a pilot project to reduce contamination. We did some projects of our own. Right now in Quebec, the contamination rate is around 10%. Uh, I know in some other places it's around 20, 25, even 30%. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. So we have to take this, those material out of the blue bin and make sure that uh, to lower the contamination. I have two images here. Uh, on the left, it's part of a, maybe a cattle or, or moose. On the right, it's what you think it is, a diaper, and it's full. Uh, so of course, that doesn't have to be in the blue bin. Three other challenges. Um, we have to be working on improving the capture rate of the recycling material, recyclable material in, in MRFs and to improve the quality of the outbound material. Some sorting centers in Quebec do a tremendous job at sorting the material and capturing the good material. Um, some are struggling, so we have to help those MRF improve their um, effectiveness and efficiency. 
Uh, of course, traceability of the material uh, and transparency is very important too. Um, one of the things that we saw since the beginning of the crisis is the distrust that some citizens have in the system right now because they saw a picture they saw uh, of people sorting material in uh, Southeast Asia or Asia or India uh, in, in very poor condition with no guarantee that the material will be recycled anyway. And even though if all of us in the industry, we know that pretty much this material can, can and will be recycled, there is really a challenge right now and, and uh, the confidence of the citizens in the system has been chatter, sh shattered. And uh, last uh, challenge that we face is to develop more uh, local material and um, feed local uh, markets with recovered material. By lo and by local, I'm, I don't mean only Quebec. Uh, North, Northeast America would be our local market. Uh, so by making sure that MERS produce the right quality of material, for those markets, it will be helpful to to feed those markets. And by developing new market for hard to recycle material, we can be sure that the material that is actually put in the blue bin by the citizens gonna get, it's gonna get recycled. So, um, in summary, the three keys to success: well, patience, collaboration, and vision. Um, EPR implementation is a continu continuous evolving process. Even though in Quebec we, we, we reach uh, already some um, good results, we can do, we still can do better. And uh, we're working toward that direction. So it's, it's an ever evolving process. Um, the second point is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I love that one. Um, uh, con um, collaboration and cooperation with all stakeholders is very important and it, it does take longer but y you're going to get much better results so it's important to involve municipalities uh, service provider merge uh, recyclers in order to put in place the best system possible and um, the third one know why you are doing it uh, have a vision no Know what you want to to offset with with a system. Um, know what the the impact will be, or what what you want to achieve with uh, an EPR regulation before uh, moving in that direction. So that's it for me. Thank you, Matthew. That was great. We have a bunch of questions coming in, and I want to encourage you to continue writing your questions and we will take all of the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and right now, we are going to hear from Joanne St. Goddard. Thanks very much, Marianne. Thank you to the Northeast Recycling Council for the opportunity and covering the, uh, the subject matter today, and uh, great to see such a healthy crowd. Um, I'm going to come at this a little bit at a macro level, uh, comparing, uh, com comparing to uh, uh, the contribution from Quebec. Um, we are um, I'm trying to advance slides there, Marianne, and it's not allowing me. I don't see your presentation on the screen. Oh, it's not. There it is. There we go. Okay. I hadn't allowed myself. Okay. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, so I'm going to come at this at a, at a macro level and um, go through a little bit of background of uh, a big sea change in the regulatory framework that has just occurred in Ontario. So I'm going to do a little bit of walk back in time to show you why we changed the way that we uh, regulated EPR in Ontario and then uh, bring you to the new world today in terms of uh, the impact and how how EPR is adjusting. So to Matthew's point about uh, ever evolving, uh, it, it rings very true in Ontario as well. Still not allowing me to advance slides. Um, go to your left corner of your screen and see if uh, Eric will come There we go. The left, there you go. Okay. 
this is the wrong PowerPoint. Can you believe this? We had this all practiced and ready to go. And I'm going to see if I can get the right one up to sweet here. That's a beautiful scene on your Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Is that a good OK, there we go. Sorry, everyone. Uh, so we're a little bit a different animal. We're an independent organization that actually does not own, operate uh, any EPR programs, but we are heavily involved in the advancement on the policy front. So we're certainly um, uh, uh, play a role in in evolving effective EPR policies here in, in Ontario and beyond. Uh, but we are completely independent and, in fact, a non-for-profit membership-based organization. And our membership has um, recyclers, uh, municipalities, uh, producers, retailers, uh, and really the full supply chain. So we're very um, unique that way, but we really draw upon the membership to hopefully influence what we call balanced but effective policies as it relates to, uh, to extended producer responsibility. So we're very focused on, on outcomes. Um, we are best known, I think, around this country and others as our instrumental role in supporting the original uh, development of the curbside PPP or packaging program known as the Blue Box, which now services upwards of 90% of Ontario's population um, and recovers just over 60% of packaging that goes into the residential sector and is now replicated in other jurisdictions as well. Uh, we uh, have some fundamental principles from which we come at um, influencing policies, including EPR, certainly an advocate for greater transparency and, and really important to be transparent as it relates to information exchange. And some of that actually colors the things that we advocate for. And you'll see that in, in the, in the um, transition of, of the EPR uh, um, regulations that are now in place. And we do a lot of facilitating of discussions of public private entities. So those interests come together to be focused on really the outcomes base, which is sort of environmental, uh, which is environmental advancement under the best uh, economic conditions. Um, and we uh, are hyper focused, if you will, on those environmental outcomes. So jumping right into printed paper and packaging or PPP as we refer to it in, in, in Ontario, um, we were part of, um, oops, there we go. Um, Ontario's PPP program began in uh, the early 1980s here, a partnership between the municipalities and a small set of producers, predominantly in the beverage category, that tested the blue box program or the concept of curbside uh, back in the late 1980s. And uh, the success of that particular pilot actually entrenched in law, and this is, this is important in context, for how we, um, the relationship between municipalities and producers today, we entrenched in law at that point in time, post pilot, that uh, any municipality with a population of more than 5,000 people was actually required to offer some kind of curbside collection for packaging. And that um, took the form of Blue Box, of course, across the pro uh, province and then now beyond. And then for over 20 years, municipalities actually subsidized, as we like to characterize it, the service through taxes. And so, as municipalities and local governments tend to do, um, they grew the service and improved it over time. Um, and and it and it uh, over that 20 years uh, expanded the service, improved the service, and of course included a broader range of of material. So uh, when that uh, regulation, uh, as we evolved EPR in Ontario, the first regulation that sort of touched us or got us closer to extended producer responsibility was the Waste Diversion Act, which was promulgated in 2002. We now refer to it um, as the old world. It's important to understand what we're transitioning from so that you get a better understanding of why we go to the new uh, regulatory regime that you're under, that we're under now. Um, the old WDA required producers to cover 50% of the costs of collection and recycling of blue box materials originally. Um, and we're still under that same financial model now, a 50-50 cost share as we call it. Um, and in fact, PPP regulation under the WDA established the first collective organization called the Industry Funding Organizations. And those collectives were given legal authority to charge producer fees to pay their 50% share. That same regulation created what was known then as the WDO or the Waste Diversion Ontario. And it was established to really work very closely with the industry funding organizations or the IFOs 
that were formed and submitted plans that uh, um, uh, were required to the WDO and ultimately the government to ensure that the regulatory requirements embedded in the regulation were, were actually met with in those plans. Um, the municipalities, though, uh, for PPP, still maintained autonomy in terms of their design of their programs and how they managed their programs. So effectively, we had 247 different individual PPP or curbside blue box programs operating in the, in the province. Those are maintained today, which meant that the scope of the materials, the service levels, and the associated costs of all of that service were different between the 247 different municipalities. So they maintain autonomy and it's a 50-50 cost share. Um, municipalities were required to report their tons into the WDO and the industry funding organization that was formed for PPP called Stewardship Ontario or SO. Um, and uh, those reported tons essentially triggered the payments um, through SO, uh, from the producers through SO to the WDO to the municipalities. So um, a few stages al uh, along the way. Um, and those reported tons uh, were had some conditions. They certainly had, the municipalities had to prove that those tons went to market. And of course, um, they were by material type and the costs were specific to those material types. And then Stewardship Ontario would use a methodology similar to uh, what Quebec was describing as um, the underpinning, if you will, uh, to charge municipality specific um, uh, costs for each of the material types associated with their packaging. So they had their own funding formula to um, extract fees from producers to pay then those municipalities uh, on a 50 cent um, schedule. Um, the industry funding organizations uh, were, uh, when they were created, were required to submit program plans to the WDO, and that was true for PPP. Those plans had to include performance targets, operational standards, and financial information. So essentially, those plans became the self-determined benchmarks for performance. Um, and those performance then had to be reported upon annually by those industry funding organizations on behalf of their producer members. Producers were required to pay into those IFOs unless they were um, uh, received approval of their own independent programs or models if they chose to submit and very few of them in the PPP world decided to do that. So for the most part, you were part of the industry funding organizations until such time as you decided to, uh, to leave them. Uh, and the only way to leave those industry funding organizations was to get your own approved plan. Um, the industry funding organizations or collectives, and this is a very key point, actually held the risk or the liability associated with non-performance or non-compliance non uh, on behalf of those producers. And unfortunately, the regulation had uh, no consequences or penalties associated with non-compliance or non-performance. So, um, uh, you know, pretty difficult to hold feet to the fire. Um, you know, one of the, the, the important pieces that sort of uh, held the performance of the blue box was, of course, the service that the municipalities continually provided and their want to continuously improve. And this, of course, the transparent reporting out to the public and to each other and, and to the government um, um, helped in the absence of consequence keep the performance of the blue box moving forward. And then the government WDO affected stakeholders, um, uh, and, and this is sort of a, a deficiency, uh, or producers really didn't have a line of sight into data or, or information gathered to inform performance. So there wasn't a lot of transparency around the data. It was just one of sort of one number that was included in the program plan that was submitted by the industry funding organization. Um, there was certainly sales information that were submitted to the collectives that informed the numerator of the diversion rate. Um, and then the municipalities aggregated uh, diversion rates became the denominator, but there wasn't a lot of detail in between that was transparent to the public. And that's since changed in the new, in the new regime and it was sort of a, um, a, 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 a seen as a deficiency in the old system. Just to give you a bit of statistics in terms of uh, the PPP performance in Ontario, we have 245 municipal 
programs that submit now to our new authority, and I'll explain what that is in subsequent slides. Our population base of, of just about 14 million and a total household counts of 4.5. Um, uh, 49 percent uh, diversion rate in our residential waste uh, system so that's PPP only sold into homes essentially um, 83 percent of the waste diversion is an, is as a combination of organics and blue box and blue box um, is sitting at 61.3 percent of the material supplied into the marketplace so that's our true uh, diversion rate as as we report it out um, you can see here um, some continuous improvement, slight continuous improvement over the years from 2012 to 17, um, encroaching on that 50% recovery rate or diversion rate. There's some specific detail in terms of material specific performance in tonnage, printed paper and paper-based packaging, of course, being the lion's share in the green, um, plastics and uh, sharing the next um, uh, largest portion of the total packaging quantities collected and glass, steel, aluminum, and so on. Um, another, uh, another sort of chart here to show by percentages what makes up the blue box in terms of material specific percentages. Um, uh, uh, by by new, numeric value, and then our total um, uh, revenues and costs. So of course there are materials that are collected that are sold, um, and those are uh, maintained by the municipalities and uh, of course taken off uh, the gross. Um, and so what producers pay are those net collection, um, recycling, promotion, education, processing, of course, administration costs as well. So total net costs of the blue box in 2017 was, was uh, about $243 million. So moving you now very quickly into the new world, this is a very, uh, it, it, this is a very dense and uh, um, um, fulsome uh, regulation. I'm going to give you a very high level sort of summary of some of the key characteristics from our perspective. It was promulgated in November of 2016 and it's called the Resource Efficiency and Circular Economy um, uh, Act. Oh, and again, I'm being limited to advance for some reason. Okay, we'll try again. There we go. Um, this was really seen as a transformational framework um, and it was in the first context as in a, in a regulatory context in the country was cited under a circular economy uh, objective. So it's the first time that we ever see the term circular economy being used in a regulatory context in Ontario. Um, it was a two-part omnibus piece of legislation with the Resource Recovery and Circular Economy Act Part 1 and then the Transition Act Part 2. Um, the RRCEA in particular really was there, the over objective, overarching objective was to set provincial direction and establish new producer responsibility regime going from the old to the, to the new and uh, the Transition Act was really the mechanism to get us there, replaces the Waste Diversion Act which uh, ensures a smooth transition from um, the old collective producer responsibility regime to the to a new individual producer uh, responsibility regime, and, and you're going to hear that IPR versus EPR context in Ontario a lot. So some of the um, um, it's going through uh, you know what was the pivotal differences, the key characteristics um, uh, of the new regime versus the old. Um, key intent was to try and support more effective, fair and open transition from an old collective IFO world where the industry funding organization really bore the liability um, and effectively the costs um, uh, um, of the system. Of course, they charge those back to producers in the case of PPP, um, but, uh, but for the most part, 
if there was non-conformance or non-compliance, it was the industry funding organization who really um, held on to that liability on behalf of their producers. Transitioning to individual producer responsibility model where uh, at the heart of it, the producer is assigned the liability. Um, so two real pivotal changes that underpin the transition, again, assigning that liability to the individual producers, but allowing those producers the flexibility to be able to manage that liability. So whether they want to join a collective like Stewardship Ontario or like the industry funding organizations, or whether they wanted to um, uh, uh, um, address or manage their obligation in another fashion independently or with, with a, a small, uh, their supply chain or a small um, group, a smaller group of of producers the key here is that the producer has the flexibility and so we got away from prescribing the how to manage your obligation to manage your obligation to this performance and we need to audit against that performance um, and you know that's where the regulation really focuses so really focused on outcomes based um, some of the some of the key results lost the screen. So some of the key results um, or outcomes of this transition, certainly there was more direct engagement, education of producers themselves. So if there was a comment made by Matthew earlier about producers really starting to understand their effect of their packaging in the system, that was absolutely one of the key um, desired outcomes of this transition. Uh, coupled with that uh, and directly related is certainly this incentive um, for having the producers who understand now the effects and the costs to improve their environmental designs uh, potentially of the package or certainly understand better um, uh, how they could improve on the collection systems. Uh, um, collection and recycling systems. And then this avoiding of cross subsidization, which is really critical between material types. If you've got a metal that's really um, attracting a revenue, uh, we don't want to be paying for, for, for plastics, which really in some cases don't have a strong market and really cost more in the collective uh, program. We don't want that cross subsidization. We want full and true cost accounting back to the material specific type. So that was again, a desired outcome that we were looking for. The other key pivotal change is the establishment of the new Resource Productivity and Recovery Authority, affectionately known as RIPRA in this province, which is really an oversight agency focused on compliance. You remember going back to the WDO, who is really working with the collectives or the industry funding organizations to deliver those program plans. Now we have the authority, which is really a registrar, um, and its main objective uh, or mandate really is to ensure that all obligated producers are complying um, to ensure that the regulatory requirements are being met by each individual producer that is co that is uh, obligated. It collects all of the sales information uh, by individual producer and audits that data against, against their recovery to ensure individual compliance and then monitors compliance to competition and consumer protection uh, legislation as well, which is really called out in the regulation and is a fundamental change. I would say not only in here in here in Ontario, but is really quite different from other regulatory regimes across the country as well. Um, uh, uh, so those two pivotal uh, outcomes were certainly features, I would say, main features of the new act. These are these are additional ones that were top of mind. Certainly moving towards higher environmental performance. So we want to push past that 50% into something north of that for PPP and this idea of continuous improvement. Um, and now we're when we talk about new regulation for PPP in Ontario, we want to look at actually material specific collection recovery targets. Again, going back to that full cost accounting and accountability for each of the materials that are part of our collective blue box program but each uh, performs on their own merit. And then ensuring that we actually have strong total provincial coverage. So accessibility is a really key part of the new, um, of the new legislative um, uh, objectives and will be, will, will shine through through the new regulations as they come in Ontario as well. Um, we want to support 
um, the legislation clearly states that it, it is supporting a, a clear hierarchy of waste reduction and resource recovery that pushes for the highest and best use of materials. So, you know, what do we really mean by recycling? Really important today, um, keeping that line of sight of where materials are going and final traceability uh, to ensure that they are in fact um, making it into recycling markets. And then a uh, really key in looping back to the new authority, this idea of strong oversight with actually uh, measures, penalties um, that REPRA has the ability to assign should they need to, to capture free riders in the system that are not paying their fair share or showing up, and then those producers who are not meeting the regulatory obligations. Um, and, and, and connected to that, of course, the strong enforcement and, and uh, auditable performance targets. So not just reporting, um, you know, a number against a program plan, but auditable, verifiable audits that uh, that that the NIMREPA can go in and uh, and and uh, verify to ensure that there's a level playing field for all producers and the efforts are are equal. And then to the uh, point about transparency. Um, making that information fully transpar uh, transparent to all of the stakeholders that are interested, the public and, uh, and the government authorities as well, and being fully, fully accountable for results. So some of the main implementation differences to IPR, sort of what does that mean for producers who are now transitioning to the, to the new world? Um, certainly individual producers are now having to register directly with the authority and provide their sales information. As previously stated, it was uh, um, to the industry funding organizations previous to this, and now they will individually be registering with with the authority um, and and that will come with a registration fee that covers the cost of the authority so it is not paid for by taxpayers or it is not um, a, a function of government per se it is an independent agency whose funding is, um, whose financial model is funded by producer registrations and other stakeholders who will be um, who have a, a, a registration requirement like service providers uh, producers declare at registration how they want to manage their obligation they don't need to go into big program plans so there is no plan submission in Ontario anymore when a producer um, registers they tell the authority I'm going to join this pro or this IFO or I'm going to do this on my own or I have I uh, have another service provider or supply chain arrangement being made so so they declare at the point of registration the mechanism to comply um, and certainly um, back to the, the true outcomes or intent of this regulation, they certainly have freedom in terms of whether they join a collective or an agent as it's called out in the regulation or whether they want to manage that on their own. Um, there's certainly new performance measurements and they adjust per material type. So whether it's hazardous waste or tires or, or, or waste electronics or packaging, each will um, have a regulation under the RCEA that's, that is specifically for that material that will call out requirements for collection, recycling and uh, performance standards as well. Um, it is certainly incumbent on each of the producers to verify the performance that they're that they're claiming at the at the end of the year of operations, um, and then those are the sort of areas where Repra has full oversight and enforcement uh, on producers. Um, we are in the middle of wind down of the monopolies or the industry funding organizations that were originally established under the WDA that I spoke about at the, uh, in the old world. We started with tires, we're now going to electronics, then will be hazardous waste and we just had our wind down uh, direction from the minister on blue box or PPP. Um, there was a, uh, there's been a long protracted process in Ontario, a lot of discussions and stakeholder uh, um, uh, hearings held to try to talk about what's the best transition, the, the best and the fairest transition between producers and municipalities to go to full EPR, full being from that 50 cent 50 cost shared model to 100% producer responsibility, um, uh, and that conversation's been 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 uh, uh, going on for for some years. Um, this new government uh, created a, a special advisor who uh, was given a very short period of time to um, 
uh, gather a subset of stakeholders to try to come up with an informed plan of how best to do that. And we've uh, uh, furnished or uh, posted on this slide a few of the association's key producers um, and municipal uh, organizations that were part of that smaller special advisor consultation groups. Um, the special advisor was then to submit that report on August uh, 6th, which he did. Um, and then on August 15th, the minister directed Stewardship Ontario, based on the contents of that submission, to begin its wind up under the Transition Act. The deadline for Stewardship Ontario to submit that wind up plan for the current cost shared model is June 30th, 2020. Um, the authority has uh, till the end of December 2020 to approve that plan. And then on January 1st, 2023, the ministry will start um, uh, uh, transitioning the first communities. Um, and the thought process here, although it's not completed, is that it will be a, um, a, a stage transition. So a portion of the municipalities will go every year until the end of December. 31st, 2025, when the entire province will move, all the municipalities will then transition um, the program ownership, if you will, over to the producers who will have full payment obligations of the system, will have full control of the system and may choose or not choose municipalities as their service providers to hit those uh, collection and recycling targets. So those are some key dates that are laid out um, in the minister's wind up plan. And now those wind up plans for each of the materials including packaging is what is the trigger to start uh, to start the transition. Joanne, um, I'm going to have the... to interrupt you. Um, yep. We're running late on time so we're going to have to um, have to ask you to wrap really? up. No problem. That's that's either the last next two slides. Uh, you can just read at your leisure. These are some of the key um, uh, deliverables or points that the special advisor made on PPP and will inform the new regulations coming out in Ontario. So uh, thanks for that. Thank you, Joanne. Lots of good information. We're going to um, change now to Dave Lafay. Yes. Can everybody uh, hear me, Marianne? I can hear you and I can see your presentation. Perfect. Let me know if uh, if the slides don't move. I just move them once. Yeah, sure. Excellent. Uh, so thank you, Marianne and uh, the Northeast Recycling Council for having us this morning. And I also want to thank uh, our co-presenters. Uh, that was incredibly informative and uh, there was a lot of information there. So thanks to Joanne and Matthew. Uh, and finally, thanks to everybody who's joined us and who's shown an interest in EPR. We're obviously very excited to talk uh, about our program here in British Columbia, Recycle BC. Um, I'll give you a little bit of quick information about myself. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for Recycle BC. I also have a position with the Canadian Stewardship Services Alliance as their Director of Public Affairs West. And so while this uh, particular presentation is very focused on the program that we've created here in British Columbia, um, during the Q&A, I might also be able to answer a few questions about what we're seeing across the country in terms of uh, full and shared responsibility systems and some of the changes that might be transpiring uh, over the next little while. Um, I'll start with who we are at Recycle BC. So we are a not-for-profit organization, um, much like EEQ, and we are responsible for the residential packaging and paper recycling throughout the province. Um, we make sure at the end of the day that household materials are both collected, sorted, and responsibly recycled. And our program is funded by over 1,200 businesses. So these businesses include uh, retailers, manufacturers, restaurants, basically any organization that supplies packaging and printed paper to BC residents and that meets a specific de minimis in terms of the amount of packaging that it is putting into the marketplace or the uh, amount of revenue that it makes per year. So extended producer responsibility in British Columbia, and I'm just going to minimize this window that's in the way. Um, at the end of the day, it's an obligation that businesses have to reduce their environmental impact, and that's in relation to the products and packaging that they're putting into the marketplace. 
In our case, it spans the entire product management lifecycle. So it is not only a shared responsibility program where we are providing a financial payment to municipalities, it also covers the physical uh, responsibility over that material. So that includes uh, all of the packaging and products that you would find in the marketplace. And at the end of the day, it shifts responsibility uh, to the companies that are putting the products into the marketplace. So what we would have had uh, five years ago prior to Recycle BC coming into existence is not unlike what you would see across North America right now, where each individual municipality is responsible for the collection, um, the management and the uh, marketing of the materials that they collect. That responsibility in British Columbia has shifted entirely to the uh, companies that are putting the products into the market. The regulation itself that guides us and the framework under which we operate is the Environmental Management Act and the Recycling Regulation here in BC. That is what directs which materials we will be collecting and we operate under a stewardship plan that we submit to the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Environment can approve, uh, request changes or deny uh, the stewardship plan that is submitted. So Recycle BC's stewardship plan is really about Recycle BC helping producers discharge their obligation under the regulation. So we provide collection services and we do that through uh, a couple of different ways. Um, we enter into contracts with municipalities for them to collect uh, materials on our behalf. We will also do direct service if a municipality chooses not to want to continue to be an interface and to provide that collection uh, service uh, on behalf of its residents, we can contract companies and do the collection of materials uh, and the municipality cease to have a role in those situations. We also hire companies in order to help us process material and at the end of the day we uh, work with the contractors to market our materials. So we have full control over the materials throughout the system. I was asked to talk a little bit about the history of BC EPR and as you can see on this slide it started a very long time ago 1970 where there was the first deposit refund system for soft drinks and beer containers in 91 we saw the inclusion of scrap tires and lead batteries uh, working our way through this you'll see that used oil was next then paint 96 97 we saw waste medication and hazardous materials uh, in 2004, the recycling regulation replaced all of the earlier regulations that I've just named. 2007 to 2012, we saw the incorporation of electronic waste uh, and the expansion uh, for all electronics and electrical equipment. And then that brought us to 2014. And in 2014, Multimaterial BC was created. That is our organization. And we rebranded in 2017 under the name Recycle BC. So the program inception, um, there were a number of things that transpired in order to make Recycle BC what it is today. And there's a number of principles that we advocated for and that we followed throughout the inception that I think are important for us to point out this morning. One of the key ones being that producers have to have the autonomy to design a recycling system that respects local conditions. Uh, so that includes uh, geography, population densities, uh, various factors that need to be incorporated into the design of the system, but at the end of the day, the producers have to have the autonomy to design that system. And that's all while driving efficiency and optimizing environmental performance. Uh, we also believe that regulations need to be designed for fairness. A level playing field is obviously necessary to ensure that all of the obligated producers participate. And regulators have to be prepared to take appropriate enforcement action against free riders. That is absolutely essential. And we do quite a bit of work with uh, the governments in the areas where we operate uh, in order to cultivate a relationship where fairness is a fundamental principle of a system. Um, we also believe that small business should not be unduly uh, burdened. And to that extent, I mentioned earlier, a reasonable de minimis needs to be established below which businesses are not required to report or pay fees. Uh, also, we would argue that flat fees should be offered for those businesses that do not fall below the de minimis, but that still uh, find themselves at a certain revenue threshold. Um, 
materials obviously have to pay their own way. I heard uh, some of our other presenters uh, making that reference and higher value materials should not be cross subsidizing lower value materials in the system. We do believe that uh, healthy competition is important. And uh, one of the key ways that we can do that is by employing best practices in the procurement of waste uh, management and environmental services. Uh, so there is uh, always a competitive process around procurement that we follow in terms of ensuring that uh, competition is healthy within the province and the waste management industry. And then finally, um, and this is very key, we need to respect municipal interests. Um, as I said earlier, there were uh, two options, uh, three options really, that were provided to municipalities when the program was brought into, uh, into place. The first option was that municipalities could continue to do what they were doing and simply not interact with the program. A bit of an odd decision, but strangely enough, some municipalities chose that option. Uh, the second option was that they remain a key interface. They enter into an agreement with Recycle BC to collect on our behalf, and Recycle BC takes control of the materials once the collection has taken place, and an incentive payment is provided to the municipalities. And the last one is uh, Recycle BC, as I mentioned, uh, has the opportunity to simply provide the waste collection service itself, and the municipality ceases to have a role in the residential recycling of packaging and paper products. Obviously, you can't bring in a program like this without significant stakeholder engagement. And underpinning that stakeholder engagement, you need some very uh, straightforward but important principles. The first and foremost being, you need to be engaging and consulting in a meaningful way. Uh, you need to provide clear and accurate and timely information. You need to be open and transparent and accountable. And you need to regularly engage and consult on stewardship plans and programs related to the activities that you are planning to undertake. In practice, that is uh, uh, a challenge, but also an opportunity. So one of the key things you need to do is you need to identify who are your audiences? Who are the main groups that you're going to need to engage? And in our case, we looked at this and subdivided it into six main categories. So you have your regulators, your producers, your municipalities, First Nations communities, waste management industry, environmental NGOs, and consumers. And then you move forward with a phased and targeted engagement program. Uh, we worked through uh, a series of workshop style meetings, more meetings than we could possibly ever name. Um, following those meetings, you take all of the information that you have and you draft a program plan, post draft plan, um, sorry, you post the draft plan for comments once you've done that. Uh, we worked with our provincial policymakers to make sure that the plan was satisfying the regulation. And then finally, you refine the program plan based on all of the information you've received uh, after you've posted the plan and after having consulted a little bit with the policymakers. Uh, you prepare your final stakeholder consultation report and you append that to the plan when you're submitting it to the government. We were asked to talk a little bit about the areas of learning that we had throughout this process, and there were a few. Um, I think one of the first things that, and probably one of the most significant things that we learned was how uncomfortable local governments were initially with the idea of entering into commercial agreements where they are providing services. Obviously, local governments have a long history of hiring companies to provide services on their behalf. But what we found was that when asking a local government to become a service provider through a contractual agreement, this was something that required uh, some time for them to process. Uh, it did work out in the end, uh, but it was definitely a key area of learning was being mindful that this was a new area for local governments to wade into, at least many of them. The other thing that local governments were really concerned about was fairness. Um, they wanted to know that it was going to be the same agreement, no matter if you were the city of Vancouver or the city of Kamloops or uh, the city of Prince George or a small regional district somewhere in the interior. Uh, and to that end, um, we ensured that there was limited customization in the agreements that we provided. In fact, there were only really three items that um, could be uh, manipulated slightly based on circumstance, and that was the insurance, the term length, um, and a few custom clauses if there were unionized staff. 
At the end of the day, transparency is essential throughout this entire process. And to that end, we posted the contract templates online. I think that went a long way to um, helping governments uh, allay their fears around fairness and knowing that they were getting, in fact, the same agreements for everybody. I'll talk a little bit about where we are today, uh, program performance. So starting with the type of system that we've created. Um, we have a network of facilities across the province because what changed fundamentally when Recycle BC came into play is that we needed to start looking at things on a provincial scale. And really that scale is what has helped us in these last five years. And certainly it has been a significant factor in our ability to weather some of the very challenging markets that the world is facing right now when it comes to the marketing of materials. We also needed to ensure that we had a consistent material list across the province. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, pre-Recycle BC, each individual municipality was choosing which materials it wanted to collect. And this created quite a bit of consumer confusion. For those of you who are familiar with British Columbia, there are many municipalities that border each other. There are neighbors who live directly across the street from each other, but live in two different municipalities and had to recycle different materials. This increased consumer confusion, it increased contamination, it had a negative impact on quality, and as a result, it had a negative impact on the marketing and performance of recycling programs. So we created a consistent material list across the province, and that has definitely helped us over the last five years. Finally, we needed to have some harmonized messaging across the province, and that speaks as well to consumer confusion. It speaks to the consumer experience, which is so very important, and it also speaks to the quality of the materials that we're able to collect. Looking at 2018 and what we've been able to achieve over the last five years, you get a sense of our accessibility. 98% of the province have access to our program at the very least through depots. Uh, we, in 2018, had 169 communities that were part of our program. We've now increased that this year to 176. So we are still onboarding some communities and it speaks to the continuous improvement that we are uh, always pursuing. We have 1.8 million households that are serviced through either curbside multifamily or depot collection and uh, just shy of 4.6 million people have access to our services. From a performance perspective, uh, these numbers are very relevant. So reported into the program are 235,000 tons uh, of material put into the marketplace by our producers in 2018. We collected 206,000 tons. Once we take away some of the materials that we're collecting on behalf of other stewardship programs, um, simply because people place them in their blue box, and once we take away some of the materials that are not our steward materials, we get a net tons collected of 183,000, which gives us a recovery rate of 78% and 40 kilograms per person. I was asked to show our revenues and expenses. One of the uh, key commitments around transparency is that we produce a uh, very involved annual report every year. I would invite anybody on the call to visit that annual report. We post all of this information there, including our accessibility, our performance standards, and our revenues and expenses. So for 2018, we saw revenues of uh, just over $86 million, uh, and we saw expenses of about $88 million. From a collection perspective, we have three different uh, streams of collection, curbside, multifamily, and depot collection. We have our standardized material list that I mentioned earlier. And one of the things that we can say is we have the largest basket of materials in Canada that we collect. And this is in the face of increasingly challenging markets for materials. As I mentioned earlier, I work for a national organization, the CSSA. I have a sense of what's happening elsewhere in Canada in different jurisdictions. We know that there are municipalities that are reducing the types of materials that they are collecting. We know that there are some municipalities that are stockpiling materials. We know that costs are going up and we actually know that there is at least one municipality in Canada that has abandoned its residential recycling altogether. In the face of all of this, Recycle BC has actually been expanding its materials over the last five years. We bring in uh, materials through our blue box, things like coffee cups, 
coffee pods, which I know are extremely controversial in some parts of North America. We can recycle them provided people uh, simply take the coffee out of them and give them a quick rinse. Uh, aerosol containers, plant pots, these are just a few of the materials that we've expanded over the last five years. And that puts us in a position to say that we have the largest in Canada. We would like to say in North America, but the reality is we don't have time to call every single municipality in the US to find out what they are collecting. In terms of contamination, there are two contamination rates that we can provide you today. One of them is related to single stream and one multi stream. Obviously, for single stream, uh, we have a higher contamination rate of about eight and a half percent for 2018. For multi stream, it hovers around four. And when you combine those two, we fall in the five to six percent range. When it comes to the incentive payment that we provide to municipalities that collect on our behalf, and I should mention, that the vast majority of municipalities chose to continue to be the interface and to enter into contracts with Recycle BC to collect on our behalf. In fact, only 13 municipalities out of 169 in 2018 um, chose the direct service option. All of the rest chose to continue to collect on our behalf. Um, in terms of the incentive payment that we pay, the municipalities get to choose how they want to collect, whether it's multi-stream or single stream. And their incentive payment reflects that. If they are collecting single stream, they receive less money as a result of the higher contamination rate. If they are collecting multi-stream, they receive more money. From a post-collection perspective, and I'm just mindful of the time here, I'll try to go through a little faster. We have a post-collection network across British Columbia, 32 receiving consolidation and transfer facilities, 11 preconditioning facilities, and one container recovery facility in the Lower Mainland. From a sorting perspective, our container recovery facility has 10 optical sorters and 12 to 14 sorting categories. Our receiving and consolidation and transfer facilities segregate our fiber and containers. They bail separately. And our preconditioning facilities, fibers are separated from containers and containers are preconditioned. Green by Nature, using this system, uh, eliminated the traditional material recovery facility infrastructure and replaced it with what you see here on this slide. And, uh, and that's significant because it took away some of the redundancy that you sometimes see in the system um, and created a more efficient and effective system. For sure. From an end market perspective, Recycle BC approves all end markets, and I'm sure a few of you have seen the CBC marketplace story. I would be happy to answer some questions about that if anybody has them during the Q&A process. But what I, what I can tell you is plastics, the vast majority of them remain in British Columbia. In fact, less than 1% of our plastics are shipped overseas. They go to a company in Malaysia. That company ships it to their sister company in China. We have visited this end market. We know exactly what is happening with that incredibly small portion of plastic, it is turned into uh, picture frames. But the vast majority of the plastic we collect, 99% uh, of it stays in British Columbia and is processed here. And in fact, has been introduced uh, back into products that local BC companies are using for their packaging. Glass stays in British Columbia. Metal stays in Canada and the United States. Paper is processed in British Columbia, North America and overseas. And this is the uh, final slide that I think I'll share with you. At least I think it's the, no, there's two more slides. Um, this is really significant because one of the key things that happened with Recycle BC's creation is we really put a focus on environmental performance. We put a focus on tracking uh, our performance. We have a very sophisticated system of tracking material movements, of uh, establishing what happens to our materials. And to that end, we are now in a position where we're able to provide not only our recovery rates at a material specific level, as you can see on this slide, but we're putting in new targets as part of our new program plan. And you can see here, the most exciting to us is plastics. Um, we have a 2017 recovery rate of 41%. Um, we have an actual recovery rate in 2017 for rigid of 50% and flexible plastic, which I think Mathieu mentioned earlier, a challenge for everybody. We have a recovery rate of 20%. But what we can do is we can start working towards a future where we are increasingly collecting these materials. And that's, I think, uh, very important, both from a producer perspective, to know that money that they are spending is actually uh, going to something that is effective and efficient and continuously improving, 
It's also important, I think, for the public, which has uh, questions around what is happening with the materials. We include all of this in our annual report and we'll be doing so uh, going forward. Now, one of the main things that we were asked to talk about was um, areas of improvement. And what I would uh, frame that as for this presentation is our special projects, because all of these special projects are about areas that we need to improve in. Uh, and it's about work that we are currently doing in order to see that improvement occur. One of the key things we're doing right now is working with the municipalities across British Columbia. I believe there's about 30 of them that form our round table and we're meeting multiple times a year to discuss streetscape. Streetscape's a big issue everywhere in the world. Uh, the challenge with streetscape, of course, is contamination. And I think Mathieu said earlier, one of the big challenges we have when it comes to contamination is if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. And so we're working really closely with municipalities to try to come up with solutions to streetscape to get that contamination down to a point where we're not greenwashing, we're actually recycling materials. Another thing that we've done over the last few years, is we've created the First Nations Recycling Initiative. And this is all about reaching out to First Nations communities across British Columbia, uh, finding out what the state of readiness is there in terms of uh, doing recycling and trying to come up with ways to help these communities um, engage in recycling programs in various ways, recognizing that for many of these communities, there are significant challenges over and above recycling that take priority in their community at this time. So we work closely with them, but we're also mindful of the fact that if you go to a community and their biggest challenge is housing, you need to um, move slowly and move at the same pace as the community is ready to move. That said, we also try to accelerate as much as possible. We work really closely with municipalities that have uh, First Nations that neighbor them in order to see if we can increase uh, and expand the collection of that municipality into that First Nation. But of course, we have to ask the First Nation first whether or not they're comfortable with that. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's all about engagement, uh, but we're quite happy with the work that we're doing in this area. Another really key issue that I think is common across North America and the world is compostable packaging and paper. What happens to it? Uh, what are the environmental results for it? We are currently doing a study to better understand it, how much of our material ends up in the compostable stream and how much of that is a benefit to the stream and how much is uh, a challenge because our understanding at this point is that there are some materials, some fibers that can actually be a benefit to composting. Obviously, there are some very challenging uh, situations when it comes to plastics that we need to be mindful of as well. We're also doing some work in terms of GHG reporting, working with all of our collectors uh, to get a better sense of just how much uh, of a GHG impact there is to what we are doing. We're creating a baseline right now, and then moving forward, we'll be able to start doing some work to um, address that. And with that, I guess I will hand it over to Marianne and to the people who are listening and uh, open it up. Thank you, Dave. I'm gonna jump right into the questions. There are quite a few. For Matthew, um, you talked about a difference um, between the municipalities covered and those being managed through curbside collection. Does that mean that industry manages the collection in, in, in the other municipalities? Matthew? Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was muted. Um, I'm not sure I, qu I quite understand the question. Um, um, every c can you repeat it or, or sure. rephrase it? You said um, there were 1,100 municipalities covered, but only mm -hmm. 557 yeah. were okay. curbside. Yeah. Okay. What yeah. happened with the others? Yeah, that that's that's just because of the grouping of the municipalities. So in the end, um, uh, there are only 557 municipalities who actually give contracts for collection and sorting of material, but, but they group some, uh, all, all the other municipalities are grouped onto uh, actually municipal groupings or uh, regional county municipalities. So in the end, all municipalities are covered. And if industry is fully reimbursing municipalities for their costs, what incentive is there for the munis to control or reduce their costs? There is a what we call an ENE factor, so efficiency and effectiveness factor. 
that is calculated by uh, the Crown Society Recyc Quebec. And with that calculation, uh, some municipalities, they get, uh, they are cut in their compensation if they don't have um, good recovery rate or and or uh, too, too high fees. So uh, how it works, and it's, it's it's fairly complicated, but um, it's it's in the regulation. Um, each uh, municipality are, are compared between themselves. So the poorest performing municipalities they they get cut. And Matthew, you showed a slide that had material costs per material type. Are those costs mm -hmm. per pound? They they are uh, dollars per ton. Dollars per ton. Okay, and then um, let's see. You mentioned uh, a term. You mentioned actual EPR, and what did you mean by that? Uh, <laughs> the, 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 that's a good question. Uh, and the um, the Ministry of the Environment put in place a, a working group, a, a committee in April, to address the challenges of curbside recycling and to um think about a a future EPR system in Quebec. Um so uh the, the there there's been some work by this committee to to uh see what the EPR system uh, could lo look like in the future. So uh the 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 work the 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 committee uh, work is underway so we, we will see some results probably soon, hopefully, that the Ministry is going to announce uh, something uh, in the coming weeks or months. So this question is for all of the speakers. Um, have you considered um, mandatory recycling, pay-as-you-throw, or fines for improper sorting uh, to increase the quality of the materials collected? Joanne, you want to start with that? Sure. Happy to. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is in Ontario, under the 50-50 cost-shared model, the municipalities only get paid for what they can prove they have marketed, so actually made it to market. So that has an inherent incentive for the municipality to try to get as clean a stream as they possibly can for each of the material types that are part of their blue box program, um, and uh, effectively, they're only paid for the net cost of what cost of what gets marketed. So that's that's really the lever. Okay, and Dave. Yeah, I'd be happy to take this one actually. So in the Recycle BC program, if a municipality enters into a contract with us to collect on our behalf. Part of that contract does have performance measures and uh, one of the key ones being contamination rate. Um, and there is an option within the contract for Recycle BC to levy a financial penalty if the contamination is too high. Um, and so there can be a penalty that is levied uh, against the municipality for uh, that challenge. That said, uh, while that does exist in practice, our, po our policy uh, or it's not a written policy, but our principle is that we prefer to work very closely with municipalities to help them reduce their contamination rather than uh, leveraging an actual financial penalty. We don't want uh, money that could be spent to having greater environmental performance being used to simply uh, fund a, a penalty system. Uh, in terms of actual fines, our understanding uh, is that there are some municipalities that have enacted bylaws in order to empower themselves to actually provide some sort of penalty to residents that are found to be uh, overly contaminating the recycling stream. Um, and, and we really think that in terms of performance, it's, uh, it's about working closely with the municipalities to help them uh, enact um, programs that reduce contamination and then it's up to the municipalities to figure out how best they need to um, leverage their powers to reduce contamination. The reality is that we do have communities that have 15% uh, contamination and then we have other communities that have 3% uh, contamination. The good news is that on a scale level across the province when we look at all of the different materials that we collect and we have the entire volume of the province there is a little bit of averaging out that happens there 
but we do need to work really closely with the communities that have high contamination to help them get down. The markets are tough, and we need to be able to uh, get some performance out of these materials. Okay, and Matthew, did you want to add to this? Yes, uh, in, in Quebec, actually, the uh, the contamination is shared 50-50 between municipalities and EQ. So municipalities prefer half the cost related to the contamination in blue bins, and EQ pays for the 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 other half. Although I have to say that I'm looking to um, with great envy with this uh, to the system in BC because I think it's a, it would only be fair to have um, maybe. Um, more ambitious objectives towards um, contamination reduction. And a question for all of you, and I ask that each of you keep your responses very um, short. Uh, are there challenges in getting targeted businesses to pay their fees into the system? Matthew, why don't you start? Um, the, the short answer is no. Uh, it takes a lot of work uh, to to identify the companies. At, at the very beginning, it, it took a lot of work, uh, but we collaborate with uh, companies association to make sure that we targeted everybody, and we never fell short of our legal obligation in any years. How about you, Joanne? Sure. Um, uh, at the onset, under the WDA, there were two companies that were actually fined for non-compliance, not participating. That only happened twice in the history of the program so far, and I know that throughout its history, the industry funding organization and the uh, WDO worked hard to ensure that everyone was participating and complying. And Dave? Yeah, I guess what I would say there is that overwhelmingly, the vast majority of producers uh, embrace their obligation and are willing to discharge it and are willing to participate. Um, there are certainly some parties that find themselves to be non-compliant and we work really closely with uh, the ministry in British Columbia uh, in order to um, inform those parties that they are indeed uh, obligated. And there are some outliers who find themselves uh, challenging a system that uh, really can't be challenged. And that's where the ministry's role is so very important uh, because the ministry has the capacity to leverage uh, or to, to levy financial penalties um, to parties that are not compliant. And Matthew, where is Quebec's plastic going today? Um, well, most of uh, the rigid plastics, uh, mostly PT and HDPE, they are recyclers either in, well, they are recyclers in Quebec and uh, in neighboring jur jurisdictions. So for those plastics, th th this is not a problem. Um, the challenge is mostly with uh, mixed plastic and films. Um, most of it is still, uh, uh, sent uh, overseas or uh, to to uh, exportation. And okay, this question is for Dave. Is it possible for a um, manufacturer to satisfy the requirements of the program by the design of their product? I'm not entirely sure what that question means. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, you defined EPR as obligation that businesses have to reduce the environmental impact of their products and packaging. Can they satisfy that obligation entirely through upstream changes without addressing end-of-life management? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, that's a good question. Uh, the only situation where I could see that happening would be if they were to reduce the packaging that they have to a point where they are below the de minimis. Um, and so, you know, there are a couple of instances in British Columbia that I can think of where there are stores that are completely uh, packaging less. People have to bring in their uh, own containers. Obviously, those stores would not be obligated. If a company were to uh, be obligated one year because they were above the de minimis, but make some changes to their packaging to the extent that they find themselves below the de minimis in terms of the amount of packaging that they're putting into the marketplace, absolutely, they could find themselves outside of the uh, outside of the program. And this 
one. Um, there are many more questions, and I realize we are even over time, but I, I will put out this last question. Do you have any thoughts as to the difference in per capita collection rate, which is nearly doubled for Quebec than BC? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that one of the biggest challenges we have in this particular field is harmonization. And so one of the things that we always say um, is you really can't compare a program to another program because there are so many intricacies to each different program design and how the numbers are crunched and what numbers are used as denominators. Um, the really important thing for people to do, I think, is go into each individual uh, annual report to ask questions and to get a better sense of what underpins um, the computations behind uh, all of the different statistics that are provided. Um, we often find ourselves in situations where media come to us and want to talk about what a great program we are in comparison to other jurisdictions. And we always start with, you can't compare us to other jurisdictions because it's not harmonized. That's your? Yes, David. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I'm glad to hear that we face the same media, I think, <laughs> the same questions. Uh, it, it's always hard to compare. Just take into consideration that uh, the deposit system are very different from one province to the other, and that in BC, I think you have a deposit system uh, on wine, for example, and, and liquors, and, and we don't in Quebec. So it, it swings the data from one side to the other. So it, it's really hard to compare. Well, we have lots more questions that we don't have time to answer right now, uh, but I would like to work with the speakers on getting those answered and sent to those who posted them. I would like to thank our speakers uh, for doing a wonderful job and for really trying to help us understand in a very short time frame what their programs are about, and I thank you all for joining us. Oh, and I should mention we have our the final packaging EPR webinar, uh, which will look at the European models, and that will be held on December 4th. So if any of you are interested in that, um, you still have time to sign up for that. Oh, I'm sorry, December 5th. Um, you still have time to sign up for that. Thank you very much, and good afternoon.